In this next series of lectures, we're going to talk about heating and cooling curves and then phase diagrams, uh, which have a bit more information in them than the cooling curves and heating curves. But we'll, we'll start with those. And hopefully you've seen these before in a previous chemistry class. Uh, this is an example of a heating curve for some any, any compound, right? Um, we don't have any values on our temperature or heating timeline. Um, so we're just, this is generic. So in a heating curve like this, we're going to have lower temperatures here at the bottom of our scale and higher temperatures here at the upper end. And so that really means that when we're reading this, this first region here, one, this is going to correspond to a solid at low temperature. It's then going to go through a phase transition between from a solid to a liquid. And when that occurs, the temperature will be constant. So here at point two, we'll be going from a solid to a liquid. Now, once this is a liquid, the temperature will start to increase again as we continually apply heat. So three is gonna be a liquid until we hit the boiling point where we will see evaporation take place. So at four, we'll be going from a liquid to the gas phase. And the temperature again will be constant during the phase change until all of that liquid has been converted completely to a gas. And then in five, we'll have a gas, which will then be increasing in temperature again as we apply heat. And so for these phase transitions, since this is a heating curve, we're going to have uh, fusion or melting and vaporization. And so if we wanted to actually calculate the amount of energy that we would have to input into a system to achieve uh, a certain change in temperature uh, that would include phase changes, we would have to break up that calculation into each of these different segments of the heating curve, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and so the different segments will have different ways to calculate it. So anything that is going to be um, where the temperature is able to increase, where we can have a change of temperature that's not zero. So that's whenever we have just a solid or just a liquid or just a gas, we're going to be able to use our equation that Q equals mass times specific heat times change in temperature. Now that specific heat will be different usually for solids, liquids, and gases. So you would have possibly up to three numbers that would be specific heats. Now, sometimes the solid and liquid specific heat are so similar that you can just assume they're the same. Um, and I'll always give you that information about which one it is on any sort of problem I ask you to do um, or any problem that I write that I ask you to do. How about that? Um, so be aware of that, that we can't just put the, the liquid specific heat for water in for the specific heat of a gas for water. Now in these regions where things are going to be in a phase change, let's do this right here, where we have vaporization, where we have fusion, we're not gonna be able to use this equation. Instead, we're going to need to use the enthalpy of fusion or the enthalpy of vaporization. To actually calculate these. And so what we will do to solve this is we'll, we'll calculate it for one region and then another and then another and another and take the sum of all of those to get a, a temperature change that would represent the whatever range we're looking at. And so let's take an example where it would be like the most extreme. It would be um, something that would go from, let's say, uh, something that's a solid to something that's a gas at some specific temperature. And that would be given to you. You would also know the boiling point temperature, which, sorry, not boiling point, the melting point, which would be this temperature right here um, when it, everything starts to melt. And the boiling point would be that temperature at which things start to vaporize. So you would need those pieces of information as well. And then each of these regions, you can calculate that heat. The, um, so for this first region right here, you would get the heat of the solid would be equal to the mass of your sample times the specific heat of the solid times the change in temperature. And that would be your starting temperature. So this, this change in temperature here would equal your starting temperature, sorry, your melting point minus your starting temperature. 
So remember our change in temperature is going to be our final temperature minus our initial temperature. Then for point two, we would calculate this, this the heat that would be applied to fuse our material would be equal to the enthalpy of a fusion times the number of moles we have of our compound. Now, if you're given molar heat capacity instead of specific heat capacity, then you would be using the number of moles times the molar specific heat times change in temperature for these regions where the temperature is actually increasing. Uh, so it's always a good thing to just make sure every your units are matching up no matter what. Uh, so for this third region, if we're given the mass, which is kind of, I see most problems tend to do that, um, we would be getting the specific, the heat for the liquid would be equal to the mass times the specific heat um, for the liquid phase for that compound times the change in temperature. And this change in temperature here would be our, um, that, that difference between the boiling point and the melting point, right? So it would be our boiling point minus our melting point. Then for part four, we're going to actually use our, to get that heat of, uh, that's used in the vaporization to be the enthalpy of vaporization times the number of moles that we would be using for our compound. And then for our last region right here, it would be the heat of our gas would be equal to the mass times the specific heat for the gas times the change in temperature. And that change in temperature right here, kind of running out of room, sorry, would be equal to that final temperature that you're going for minus the boiling point. And that's kind of a rough outline of everything that you would possibly like kind of the most, the longest kind of thing. And once you had all of those, those values calculated, then that, that total heat or that total energy that you would need, we'll call it heat, is going to be equal to the heat you calculated for the solid, plus the heat that you calculated for that fusion phase, plus the heat you calculated for the liquid phase, plus that heat you calculated for the vaporization phase, plus the heat you calculated for the gas phase. So at the very end, you have to add all those up. So we'll go through an example of this, but before that, I want to point out something about heating and cooling curves. So we just looked at a heating curve in detail, and we'll do a practice problem that looks at a cooling curve too. Um, cooling curves are going to have the opposite, right? So the, uh, our compound will start at a high temperature and the gas phase right here. And then it's going to go into the liquid phase and then the solid and its phase transitions are going to be condensation and freezing. Uh, and so, so it'll just look like the opposite. But what these two graphs are showing are this kind of interesting phenomenon of supercooling and superheating. And this will happen if you keep the compound very still through the cooling or heating process. And what can happen if you keep things very, very, very still, very still <laughs> uh, when you're cooling is that you can actually surpass the expected freezing point and you can cool it past it and it'll remain a liquid past that freezing point and then it'll suddenly all freeze and come back up to it. And so there's this weird kind of point right here. And now a similar thing happens when you're heating with the liquid phase. If you keep that liquid really, really, really still, then you can actually superheat it past its boiling point. And then it'll, with a little bit of kinetic energy, it'll then come down to the boiling point and just like suddenly explode with like overflowing bubbles. Um, and so I've got some YouTube links here to both of these phenomenons. And um, I'm going to actually have you then, I'll just like put these in underneath this video. And so you can watch them afterwards. They'll be just short clips. And it's just, it just looks really cool. And I will say this, the, he, the superheating example or the superheating story I have is like the worst story that I have of my experience teaching lab, which is that we were heating oil to make soap in an organic chemistry lab. And the students forgot to put in a stir bar. And when that occurred, they went to go stir it with a rod and it exploded in this volcano of boiling oil and got all over their arms and and, and it was a nightmare, but I'll pause there. Um, next, we're gonna walk through an example and then we're gonna go ahead and walk through another practice problem. 
So in this example, we are told to draw a heating curve for ethanol um, and calculate the amount of energy that needs to be absorbed or released by a five gram sample um, as it's heated. And it's gonna be heated from an initial temperature of negative 120 degrees Celsius to a temperature of 78.4. And we're looking at all of the ethanol being vaporized, which means at the end of the phase transition, because at the beginning of all the ethanol vaporizing, the middle and the end, it'll all be the same temperature, 78.4. So we wanna know what happens by the end of that whole process. So we have just a gas at 78.4. Uh, the information we have here is its melting and boiling point. We also have the specific heat of ethanol and heat of vaporization and a heat of fusion. Now, a note about the specific heat of the ethanol. It's really similar when you look at it at the um, gas, or sorry, the solid and the liquid phase. So the specific heat of ethanol as a solid and liquid is very similar. So we're gonna assume it's the same. The same actual value. So, all right, so let's, let's draw this curve and then let's calculate this. Um, so for any heating and cooling curve, we're really looking at just the heat that's applied to the system versus temperature. And if we're heating something from a low to a high temperature, we're going to start low. And this one negative 120 degrees Celsius tells us where we're actually starting in this picture. We know that its melting point is negative 114. And since this negative 120 is less than that, we're starting as a solid. So I'm going to draw a heating curve with the two phase transitions. So we have our solid, we have our solid melting into a liquid, we have a liquid, a liquid evaporating into a gas in the gas phase. And we're basically going to try to go from the end of that vaporization process from a starting point here as a solid. Now we can also label these as the different types of phase transitions that we actually have. So we have fusion and we have vaporization. Oh, sorry, kind of ran into the G. Um, all right, and so that is our, our ethanol heating and cooling curve. We can also put in here the temperatures for that, that melting point and for that boiling point. So we can put in the negative 114 and we can put in our 78.4 degrees Celsius for those as well. And, and that's, I would call that a pretty good heating curve. Um, so now we're gonna do some calculations and we're gonna need to have to look at this in a few different pieces. So first we're going to calculate this part right here. Uh, here, let's highlight this, this region right, actually let's use green. We're gonna calculate this region right here and our liquid region using our Q equals um, mass times specific heat times change in temperature. Then we're going to use this fusion piece right here using our enthalpy of vaporization. And then we're going to go ahead and use the, um, or sorry, not our enthalpy of vaporization, our enthalpy of fusion. There, we've got a color coordinated plan. Color coordinated plan. All right, well, so then at this point, we should just go ahead and start calculating. I'm also noticing right off the bat that our enthalpy of vaporization and our enthalpy of fusion is given as joules per grams rather than joules per mole, which means we'll be able to use that five grams without converting it into moles. If instead I had a specific heat that had units of grams and heat of vaporization or fusion that had units of joules per mole, I would just take that five grams and divide it by its molar mass to calculate the number of moles that it represented for those phase change calculations. All right, so, um, so what we're gonna do is start with calculating the energy as the solid phase, and then um, we'll go to our transition for the phase change, and then we'll do liquid, and then we'll do our second phase change. So Q for the heat for, the solid, it's gonna be equal to uh, this mass times specific heat times change in temperature. Our mass is 5.0 grams. 
Our specific heat is 2.44 joules per grams degrees Celsius. And remember our change in temperature is always equal to that final temperature minus our initial temperature. So this will increase in temperature until it hits the boiling point. So the final temperature, or sorry, until it hits the melting point. So our final temperature is that negative 114. And it's going to be minus our starting point, which is the negative 120 degrees Celsius. And it's, it's, that's it. So adding or plugging that all into our calculator, we're seeing a plus seven um, degree change in temperature. We're going to calculate 85.4 joules. All right. Step one. All right, next let's look at the uh, heat that needs to be applied to get us through the fusion phase. Uh, so that heat for a solid becoming a liquid is going to be equal to our five grams times our 109 joules per gram, which will equal 545 joules. Great, pretty straightforward. Uh, next, we'll um, calculate the heat that we need to increase the temperature of our liquid from the melting point to the boiling point. So again, this is our 5.0 grams. Uh, we're multiplying this by our specific heat, which is that, let's do it like this, 2.44. And now our final temperature will be the vapor, the boiling point where it starts vaporizing. So that's going to be our 78.4 degrees Celsius. And we're going to start initially at the point where we've stopped melting the ethanol. So that's going to be at its melting point, which is that negative 114 degrees Celsius. So we're going to see about 192.4 change degree change in temperature as it heats up. So plugging this all into my calculator, I calculate 2,347.3 uh, joules. And I really have only two sig figs here for all of these, um, but I'll, I'll do that at the end. Uh, then once we hit that liquid, we're going to go to the end of the vaporization phase change because uh, we want all of the ethanol to vaporize. So we want everything to be a gas, but still at 78.4 degrees Celsius. So we just have one more to calculate going from a liquid to a gas. That's going to be equal to our 5.0 grams times our uh, heat of vaporization, which is that 841 joules per gram, uh, which is going to give me a value of 4,205 joules. All right. So now my goal is to add up each of these right here. And so when I take that sum and just I'm adding them up in my calculator, I get a value that is 7,182.7 joules. Great. I really only have two sig figs since I have that 5.0 grams that I started with. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just round this to 7,200 joules. Right there. 